camera. Recording in progress. Who's got this? Ah, what the? <laughs> okay. All righty, all righty, 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 righty. Here we go. Make sure everybody's here. Hi, everyone. Let's see, everything's everything's all hooked up. All right, well, rainy day today kind of looks like how I feel outside. You guys hear about the pathetic fallacy? If you've ever taken an English literature course, the pathetic fallacy, that's, that's how I feel today. Pathetic fallacy is, you know, when you're, um, when you're watching a television show or reading a book and uh, you learn about the character's mood and the environment that the character is in reflects the character's mood. So for, uh, and pathetic pathos, uh, suffering is usually, it's usually negative. So, you know, maybe your main character will be very sad and uh, it's raining outside, you know, pathetic fallacy. <laughs> I woke up to these gray skies after a terrible night's sleep, and I thought, oh boy, I'm, I'm feeling that pathetic fallacy today. Um, so, uh, interesting developments here. Um, one of the reasons why... One of the reasons why... Um, I did not get the best sleep is that the honking returned. So I hope that I hope that everyone else wasn't too disturbed um, by this. Uh, it seemed to occur, uh, and maybe we'll even get back to talking about this again um, because current events are are unfolding. As you know, events are actually unfolding as we speak downtown. I think. Um, um, but I, I hope that if if any of you live in the downtown area, you weren't too disturbed by the honking which returned. Um, it seems to have been uh, in response to um, the police distributing uh, flyers. You know, they were distributing those flyers like they did in Windsor uh, at the bridge blockade. Distributing flyers, letting people know to, to leave um, and, uh, you know, various uh, charges that could be brought uh blah 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 right all of the stuff they were informing the the occupants of what was going to happen and and i guess they didn't like that and they started honking and i was i was hearing it and i'm i'm like on the edge of the market edge of the byward market so i'm not in the thick of it but i could hear it like up until probably around 11 11 p.m midnight around there it was yeah so yeah nerves are frayed here i'll tell you what but maybe we can talk about that when we talk about risk benefit analysis, which we will do um, toward the, the end of this lecture. What I want to do is just really try and wrap up the chapter on uh, rationality. Um, I've said this before, and I've always got this crazy hair situation in the morning. <laughs> I've said this before, um, but uh, some of the chapters in this textbook I'm finding, you know, just a little dry. And um, it's very summative, not much by way of actual argumentation. I suppose that's all right for our purposes, but um, I wanna finish the discussion of rationality. We'll stick quite close to what I have on my slides for that. Uh, and then there's a section at the end on risk benefit analysis. Um, oh, no, I don't want to record. Uh, and we'll do that. Uh, but that's going to be a lot more free form, uh, just to sort of take up the rest of the class. And if we have to end early, or if, if we end up ending early, we will. Um, because, uh, yeah, <laughs> because I would like to get this chapter over with and move on to something else once we return from reading week. And that's right, reading week is coming up and I'm sure you're all anxious to um, begin 
reading week. We've got the long weekend, right? It's going to be family day. Maybe you'll spend time with your family on the long weekend. Maybe you'll spend time with friends. Um, but I'm sure everyone's looking forward to a bit of a break. So, oop. Uh, my slides today are also quite quote heavy. Um, again, honking, interfering with prep work. So I apologize. Um, but in any case, uh, we were talking about reason, of course, the subject of the chapter. We were talking, uh, I think we left off uh, uh, talking about Kant and uh, contrasting Kant with Hegel. So remember, Kant has three treatises on reason. Three, the three critiques, right? Pure reason, practical reason, and judgment. Uh, and Kant, uh, or Kant, <laughs> I mean, well, even Kant isn't right. I'm not, I'm never saying anyone's names completely right in this class, I, I'm sure. I'm constantly mispronouncing philosophers' names. But Kant uh, thinks of reason, um, or thinks of, uh, thinks of, uh, you know, it includes within his understanding of reason um, things like scientific reasoning, uh, pure reasoning, um, all of that. Uh, but there's only so much that we can actually understand. So we have we have a quite, you know, quite a, a number of different kinds of reasoning under our understanding umbrella, if you like. But there's a limit to what we can actually understand because... <coughs> Uh, just because of the way our minds are sort of set up to deal with the world. Um, I'm talking here about the forms of intuition, and those are space and time, and the categories of the understanding. These are sort of like um, ways that the mind presents the world to us. And for that reason, we can only understand phenomena, appearances, not things in themselves, which are noumena. And there are certain uh, anti, um, anti, uh, anti blah, I'm mispronouncing words like crazy today, actually. There are certain like, uh, um, you know, things where reason breaks down, I guess, for Kant, things that we um, Things that we can't really reason about or can't understand, like God. Um, because God is supposed to transcend space and time. Um, but we can't do that. Uh, because space and time are, uh, you know, they're not, they're not out there in the world. They are ways that the mind presents or, or, or ways through which the world is presented to us by the mind. So... Uh, Hegel disagrees. I mean, Hegel's, Hegel's a, a German idealist like Kant, uh, but he doesn't think that these, uh, um, you know, problems with reasoning are really problems. These are sort of um, rather how uh, the dialectic works, right? As we talked about last time, um, Hegel, uh, Hegel uses this term uh, Aufheben to, uh, to capture this, this, this dialectic that he sees, which he thinks is actually happening in history and society, right? Reason is actually the reason, the dialectic that is reason is actually happening in the world. It's not just, um, it's not just something like Kant or Plato and Aristotle would have thought of dialectic as uh, something that happens in, in thought or speech, uh, this is something that actually happens through society and history. So Hegel's dialectic, which he captures with Alf Haben, uh, which, you know, means to, you know, means to like, uh, means both to like negate or, 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 or sublimate, but also to raise up. Uh, it's meant to capture this thesis, antithesis, synthesis uh, way uh, that, that the dialectic unfolds, right? So you have a thesis, then you have an antithesis, which counters that thesis, and then some kind of new synthesis. Uh, Marx was also a Hegelian, Karl Marx, as was his buddy Friedrich Engels. Um, so Marx also thinks that um, the dialectic is unfolding through society and history, but it's not reason for Marx, it's, it's class struggle and, and stuff like that, historical forces. 
uh, to do with class struggle. Uh, Engels himself thought of nature as a dialectical process, which is really interesting. Um, I wonder, I, I don't know too much about his thinking on this, but I wonder what that meant for Engels. Um, like how would Engels have, have thought about Darwin, for example? Uh, would he have applied this? Would he have thought of uh, something like natural selection as a sort of dialectical process in nature? I don't know. Um, uh, but that's where we are, right? Uh, dialectic for, I guess, you know, traditional philosophers, big philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, and Kant. Uh, it's something that we do with, with thinking, with speech. Um, it's just something that happens philosophically. Hegel thinks it's happening in society and throughout history, as does Marx. And Engels goes even broader than that. Then we get to the 20th century, where we can talk about the critical theorists. And I'm just going to read what Duzek writes here. He says, the 20th century German critical theorists, such as Herbert Marcuse and Jürgen Habermas, took out the notions of Kant, Hegel, and Marx. They attempted to develop a dialectical approach to the criticism of modern industrial capitalist technological society. They saw modern technological society as in the thrall of instrumental reason. Technocratic and positivist notions of superiority of scientific technological reason and the meaninglessness of traditional metaphysics and ethics are the ideology of modern society. The pushing of questions of ends and values out of the realm of rational investigation and discourse serves to prevent criticism of the implicitly ruling values and the values of the rulers. So this is really, I, although these thinkers to me, and I'm just riffing here, although it sounds like Duzek is presenting these readers as working very much in the tradition of Kant, Hegel, and Marx, which they are, right? I, I'm not denying that. Uh, there's also something um, a little bit platonic here, I guess, uh, is what I want to say. Um, I think Plato agrees, uh, or Plato would agree, uh, because, as we discussed in earlier lectures, Plato sees um, dialectical reasoning as superior to other forms of reasoning. I think if you were to say to Plato, hey, look, if we want to have a good society, we can't just have instrumental reasoning. We can't push dialectical reasoning out of the picture. Of course he would agree. Um, what, what these... Um, what these critical theorists are saying is like, look, if we remove, uh, if we have instrumental reasoning ruling the way we run society, um, if we're sort of right in the thrall uh, of instrumental reason, a thrall is a slave. If we're slaves to instrumental reason, well, we can't, uh, if we're not doing metaphysics and ethics and we're only doing instrumental reasoning, how are we gonna question anything about what we're doing, right? Maybe, uh, maybe we've got means and reasoning running the show and we've got a really efficient society, but is it the society we ought to, to, to be striving to, to have and maintain? If we don't do ethics and metaphysics, especially ethics though, um, we don't question the ideology that's running our society. We don't get to question um, the values of the rulers, as Duzik says here. Um, yeah, we're, we're in, we're in thraldom ourselves. Uh, and this is a danger of instrumental reasoning that the critical theorists, uh, that's what they're talking about here. I wonder if we can think of any examples of instrumental reasoning, uh, running the show and, um, no attention paid to uh, maybe maybe traditional metaphysics, but but especially ethics. Can we think of any examples, any historical examples, or any modern current examples? Max, go ahead. I mean, like, is this is this the question where I need to say like Nazi Germany, or to say like any <laughs> colonial enterprise, or like anything that prioritizes resources and like capital interest over? The lives of people that work in it like i think there's a lot of examples of instrumental reasoning i'll give you like three fun facts okay uh number one uh colonization of south africa um for resources um number two colonization of the rest of africa for resources 
Um, <laughs> That's yeah. Those are yeah. yeah. <laughs> Number three, right. um, Amazon workers not getting told, not getting allowed to leave the 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 house or not leave. Sorry, leave the warehouse, and then they die in the uh, hurricane. Uh, ah, yeah. That's my third one. Those are good examples. Uh, yeah, those are. I think those are good like examples. Pri- it just it just simply the basic idea of prioritizing something else above human life, and that just immediately comes into conflict with ethics, especially deontological ethics. Yeah. So and yeah. And, and and Stefan in the chat says uh, diamonds, rubber, etc. Um, which I think I think there's definitely some crossover there. Um, we know that diamonds. Uh, well, diamonds are. Um, I mean, everybody's heard about blood diamonds, right? Uh, rubber, rubber comes from trees, right? So we're talking about, uh, <clears throat> uh, we're talking about, or no, that's cork that comes from trees. Or no, no, rubber comes from trees too. Vulcanized rubber, it's a tree sap. Yeah, sorry, I'm getting my tree resources mixed up here. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, anything where we're dealing with colonization, uh, when we're after resources and a lot of colonized, I mean, really, like, that's what it was all about. Um, I mean, um, I mean, Christopher Columbus was not trying to explore just for the sake of exploring. Um, he was trying to get to uh, India, uh, to China, to Japan. He was trying to get to these faraway places. Um, and he was trying to do it via the sea because... Maybe it was dangerous to do it on land or it was uh, tricky to do it by sailing. If you had to do it, uh, you know, if you wanted to sail to India before uh, pre-Columbus, you would have to sail around Africa and into the Indian Ocean. Um, and that's what people did. Columbus thought that this could be done by simply sailing across the, um, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, did not know there was a continent in the way and also thought that the earth was smaller than it actually was. If he had not um, landed in the Caribbean, um, his crew most certainly would have died. Um, and of course, we all know that once Columbus arrived, uh, his exploitation of the natives uh, was, was, was incredibly brutal. Um, so it's always kind of been about resources. I mean, even if you think of Canada, I mean, what was Canada built on? Um, beaver pelts and things like this. And yeah, um, you know, uh, the French were, I think, um, the French traders were, had, had a much better rapport with the First Nations than the British did. But yeah, I mean, you see the, you see the, uh, uh, you see the, you can, you can kind of see what I'm saying uh, or what Max said about colonialism. My example was the gasoline engine. You know, uh, and even prior to that, the steam engine, you could, you could probably argue, which ran on coal. Um, and steam engines weren't just used in locomotives during the Industrial Revolution. They, they generated power, um, which ran manufacturing plants. Um, and then later came the gasoline engine, which made things even more efficient, which meant that we could have uh, horseless carriages and all this newfangled technology. Um, uh, then you had Henry Ford, uh, who was the assembly line guy, right? Let's have, uh, let's have everything be super efficient, make an assembly line, make lots of cars. Everyone has a car, right? You get a car, you get a car. Before we know it, everyone in America, every household, one, maybe two cars. So we're pumping out CO2 like, like, like nobody's business. And yes, some people were pointing this out. Um, there were concerns published, uh, scientists publishing concerns about CO2 emissions and the greenhouse effect, or the greenhouse effect, actually quite early. Um, as time went on, uh, you know, you, you, you've always had advocates uh, for, for the environment, um, but it's only recently, I think that, you know, relatively recently, the people have really kind of gotten wise to the idea that we, you know, that, that, that climate change is a reality and that it's caused by human activity. Um, 
So nowadays, you know, uh, we're aware of this, but previous to this, there was a lot of lobbying, um, you know, uh, a lot of obfuscation of real science um, when people would question the values of the people in charge. Like, why are we, you know, questioning the motives of um, auto manufacturers, the, the leaders of audio, auto manufacturing companies, petroleum companies, right? Anyway, that was my example. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Let's go on to the next slide. Come on, slow computer. Why is it? Oh, there we go. Ah, so I'll just talk. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so uh, I'll say a little bit more about Herbert Marcuse here, whose work I'm not super familiar with. So try not to overstep my expertise here. But according to Dusek, uh, Marcuse actually thinks of um, instrumental reasoning, positivism, uh, as the implicit doctrine of the military industrial bureaucracy. Bureaucracy. Remember, previously I mentioned um, this this term, the military industrial complex. Uh, uh, that is um, that's a famous uh, idea from Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, during his farewell address. He um, he fears the military industrial complex. Um, it's kind of the sort of thing we've been talking about, but with um, you know, not just gasoline engines, but military technology. And Eisenhower would know because this is how uh, this is how the Second World War was fought. And Eisenhower was a general in the Second World War, right? In the Second World War, um, assembly line technology was how all of the all of the all of the parties, both the Axis powers and the Allies, um, that's how they did things, right? And uh, so you have this, you have this thing where you have all this stuff that needs, you have all this uh, um, machinery and infrastructure for making military equipment. Um, it needs to be used and it needs to maybe be sold if it's a private company making this stuff. Um, uh, and, and, and it needs to be used. So there needs to be a conflict somewhere. And it's all this big cycle that just keeps rolling forward, this war machine that keeps turning, right? Um, I think I just quoted a Black Sabbath song, huh, weird. Um, so yeah, the military industrial bureaucracy, the, the, the bureaucracy that sort of runs and maintains the military industrial complex, their implicit doctrine is instrumental reasoning. It's a simple claim, but yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think that Marcuse definitely has a point here. So he contrasts, this limited uh, instrumental reasoning with, as I did previously, uh, the metaphysics of uh, thinkers like Plato and Aristotle here. So Plato and Aristotle, it's not that Plato and Aristotle were never did any instrumental reasoning. They never, it's not like that. It's not like that was the case, especially with Aristotle, because, you know, Aristotle was big on practical wisdom. You have to work out um, the right ends and the means to achieve them. But part of that, it's not just, you know, um, cars need to go faster, build, build bigger, better cars, build more cars, sell the cars. Ah, it's not just instrumental reasoning run amok like this. You have to question um, the ends, you know, what ends should I actually go for? What goals should I strive for? What should I value? And in getting to them, in getting to those ends, what's the best way to do that? Best is, does not mean more, most efficient. The best way means like the most ethical way, um, the way that's best for you as a human trying to live a good life. So, um, so yeah, means and reasoning is a part of what Plato and Aristotle did, but it's definitely not the whole, the whole story because, because Plato and Aristotle did a lot of ethics and metaphysics. Uh, Duzek uh, further writes, that Marcuse claims that Weber's decisionism, subjectivity with respect to value, and emphasis on social rationalization implicitly serve ultra conservative ends. Marcuse even hints that Weber's emphasis on arbitrary decision and charismatic leadership of the ruler points toward fascism, despite Weber's own anti socialist liberalism. 
Marcuse even draws parallels between the analytical philosophers debunking of metaphysical reasoning and the witch hunting government investigators claiming not to understand the language of their politically radical targets. Here I think we're talking, um, well, it's Marcuse who was also a German thinker, probably talking about, um, oh, Max, you have your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, um, the thoughts of uh, on Weber are pretty, um, are pretty interesting because like being like a sociologist, like he identified how like people like do give up like personal parts of their lives like for a greater cause. So like through his like perspective, a lot of it was like Christianity, but also like the market. So when it comes to sort of like, like the social rationalization, uh, like going towards ultra conservative means, like I think a lot of that was emphasized by like the ability for people to, like not the ability, like more like the phenomenon of people like congregating and then like following like a leader based off of like, Things that serve their ends so i i think it's interesting to like ultra conservative ends because like maybe we need to talk about what this guy means about ultra conservative ends like does he mean like ends that are like more towards like uh like less less rights or less like freedoms is that what he's implying there like that's I, the question I have yeah i i'm again i'm no expert on marcuse um but it seems to me, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what else he could mean by ultra conservative other than something like fascism. Like fascism, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what else that means. And and the Nazis, like they did that. Exactly like that was, what yeah. you were exactly what you were describing. Like when Hitler, when Hitler came to power, um one of the first things he did, and this is I think why the German people were were so psyched about him uh was that he did get the economy going again right um uh, the build building the autobahn uh volkswagen right that yeah was, the, you pe know, the people's the people's car the people's, people's car yeah the car the wagon of the volk right like so yeah. um he really did do that um and you can compare that with like the new deal right in the states uh, the New Deal was uh, uh, controversial in the States because it sounded like socialism uh, and people didn't want that. But, this, but that, was, that was how the United States kind of got themselves out of the Depression. Let's also uh, build some more in infrastructure and we'll, we'll, the government will inject some money into the economy, get people working. Hitler did that too, but Hitler did it in a very kind of like, you know, like, oh, I'm the glorious leader kind of way, right? Um, so, yeah. Uh, la, la, la. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a point. Taking a bunch of loans you have no real way to pay back isn't the most sustainable approach. Yeah. Um, well, that, yeah. Um, well, I'll come back to that point. But Vicente's had his hand up for a bit. So I'll go ahead. Yeah, I was going to mention that... Uh... Like, like I said on the class before, uh, I'm using a, an author that speaks and draws a, a direct line from uh, Weber's uh, sociology to Nicholas Luhmann. I don't know if you've heard of him, but the thing is that Luhmann basically says that he likes sociology should just study social systems and that social systems are not confirmed by humans, just by their communication. So he literally says, like, you shouldn't care about humans in society. Like, we didn't, shouldn't care about values and stuff like that. We only should care about communication being more efficient. And, and wow. he takes Bever's point. So I, I feel like that's maybe what Marcuse is also pointing to. Like, you could use this, I'm just going to analyze and not say what I really think about things to, <laughs> to push things where you want. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. And that's, that's, yeah, that, okay. So, and that's the problem that we're confronting here, uh, I think, really, is that is that what happens when values don't get questioned or don't get discussed? Um, that's the problem with instrumental reasoning that I think, uh, like like you say, if I understand what you what you mean, that th this is this is the problem that that um, this is also sort of similar to what Marcuse is saying. Um, 
yeah, when we're talking about, just to come back to Stefan, um, when we're talking about government bailouts, yeah, sometimes uh, they have to borrow money. Uh, I'm no economist, but um, like governments can, yeah, I mean, I guess this all depends on, on, on which situation we're talking about. Are we talking about the New Deal? Are we talking about Nazi Germany? Are we talking about the bailouts? Um, like during the financial crisis in the United States. Uh, I, yeah, I'm just, I'm just not an economist, but um, Weber, uh, Max says Weber also relied on Christianity as a limiting factor for ethics. Mm, yeah. It's funny how a lot of thinkers do that. That also kind of would suggest to me, um, I, I would get a whiff of, of like ultra conservatism um, from that, right? If someone comes to me and says that, um, and this is not meant uh, as, a, as, a, as a dig at anybody who might be religious, um, but if somebody comes to me and says like, oh, we don't need to do philosophy because Christianity already tells us what's right and wrong. <laughs> like what? Uh, that's like, that's some Jordan Peterson shit right there. Like, that, like no, no, you need to do more philosophy. Um, you can't just say, oh, it's fine. We have Christian ethics. Like what? No. What are you talking about? We got to do, we've, we still have to do ethics. <laughs> yeah, I never, I went to public school. So yeah, yeah, what would Jesus do, right? What about Amish people? Amish people, well, Amish people are interesting. Um, all, all Anabaptists are interesting. Uh there's a there's a uh, very large uh, Mennonite community where I'm from, so so I grew up with some Mennonites, and their uh, their beliefs. It's not all exactly the same, but they're all Anabaptist Christians. Um, and yeah, I I guess, I mean, I mean, I don't know what what about them. They're from what I know, they're quite collectivist. Um, they don't actually eschew technology to the, at least not the ones that I knew when I was growing up. Yeah, yeah, so they do um, with their own rules and morals. Uh, but some of them, like there are those that still live more traditionally and there are those that, you know, that don't. Um, the Mennonite community from Northern Ontario, which is where I come from, uh dressed simply uh that was one of the things that i noticed is uh they dress simply traditionally uh, but they still use technology um in fact they had some of the best farming equipment uh and it was because it was kind of collectivist right you know they can all pitch in and get the best tractor the best like hay cutter the best baler i still remember i mean i'm sounding like pretty country right now but they had this massive square baling uh machine maybe you've seen if you've driven through the country and you see people cutting cutting hay those little square bales of hay ones that you could pick up there's big round ones you give them to your horse or your cow or something and you can you can roll those but you need a tractor or some kind of machine to lift them yeah the marshmallows yeah they look like giant marshmallows but then there are really big rectangular bales that are probably like two or three of the marshmallows, right? And, and they had that machinery. Uh, and I always thought like, wow, I've never seen a hay bale that big before. So uh, I guess it, it depends on the community, right? Uh, so, so the folks that I knew back home, they were, they were Mennonites, um, uh, not, like, not completely isolated from the community at all. One of them, one of them still to this day owns, owns a really good restaurant um, back home. I like to go there every time I go back home. Really good home cooked food. Um, but yeah, you know, they're using technology. Uh, but some, yeah, we still see some, some, uh, some, some Amish communities still use uh, horse-drawn carriages, for example. 
uh, the Anabaptists that I knew used pickup trucks. So I guess it depends, but yeah, they kind of have their own communities and it works. And I think it works. I guess this is the point I'm trying to get to is for Anabaptist communities who, who kind of stay um, close together, uh, tight knit, very communitarian. It works because there actually are quite small communities. Um, and as Max says, yeah, tax breaks, I guess, because of, because, because of, uh, farming and religion, maybe, although I don't, I don't really know. Um, so yeah, well, that was a good discussion. Uh, what time is it? 12, 12. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. Maybe I'll keep doing this where I quote a passage that I think is interesting and we can just talk about it. Maybe I'll keep doing that after reading week. So that was Marcuse. Uh, he's worried that some of what Weber uh, thinks could could sort of lead to, you know, ultra conservative authoritarianism, fascism, in other words. What about Habermas? Habermas thinks that uh, instrumental reasoning works fine. There's no problem with uh, instrumental reasoning for science and technology itself. But the problem is that um, we, he's, he's not a technocrat, right? He, he doesn't see instrumental reasoning as an adequate basis for a good society. And I think he's right about that. I think he would, you know, there's a lot of agreement here between thinkers like Habermas and Marcuse um, and the ancients like Plato and Aristotle. There's a lot of agreement there, I suspect. Duzik explains Habermas as follows. He says, quote, Habermas sees the error not in the application of instrumental rationality to technology, but in the extension of instrumental rationality to other areas, such as politics and the family. According to Habermas, scientism and technocracy are the theoretical and political manifestations of this illegitimate extension. Habermas contrasts instrumental rationality as appropriate for the manipulation of things by the individual subject or knower with communicative rationality in which two or more humans interact. Borrowing from the phenomenologist Edmund Husserl, Habermas calls this realm of everyday human interaction the life world. So we've got this life world wherein we have communicative rationality, okay? Um, this is like uh, communicative rationality is how humans get along together. I, I guess if you wanted to, you could think of it, this is how I think of it. I think of it as how we do the dialect amongst ourselves, right? Communicating our thoughts, using language, and reasoning by doing this. That's the dialect. That's communicative rationality. That's what we're doing in our life world. Right now, right now, we're in the life world, okay? Um, scientism and technocracy. We haven't talked too much about scientism, but... I'm really actually not sure how different scientism is from technocracy. Let's just stick with technocracy, right? Technocracy, technical experts should rule. Society should be governed according to uh, means and reasoning. Okay, um, that is for Habermas illegitimate. Um, means and reasoning shouldn't be used in the life world in place of communicative rationality. So instrumental reasoning. Imagine, imagine if we all, imagine if we all did that. Let's 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 put our Kantian hats back on, um, and just imagine if everybody, everybody, um, if everybody just, you know, acted in the world in the, in this kind of instrumental way. Could we will that become a universal law? I mean, let's apply the categorical imperative and see if we can see if we can uh, make that make that work. I don't think we can. Um, not only would it be illegitimate for me, um, as as Habermas says, and not only does it strike me as unethical. If you think about it in kind of like deontic terms, what if everybody acted like a technocrat? Uh, it seems like it would be a pretty lame society. But also, I think it's unnatural. Um, I think that humans, 
Uh, I mean, like Aristotle says, right? In 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 um, I think it's the metaphysics. All men by nature desire to know. And, you know, I, I mean, all people by nature desire to know. Um, I think people, uh, and maybe I'm projecting here, I don't know, but people have a sort of tendency to want to understand things. Um, and we do that by thinking and by talking about things amongst ourselves. We participate in the life world. Um, the life world is kind of like our our sort of natural groove, I think, uh, as humans. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think it'd be weird if, if, uh, if instrumental reasoning was running the show. Max, you had oh, your yeah. hand up. Um, I was just taking the chat, but uh, I was wondering, like, how could everyone be a technocrat? Like, just like, logistically, like, if a technocrat <laughs> is, is like someone that is like a specialist or like has like the ruling class, like to be ruled by the technocrats, if everyone's a technocrat, then like, what's the difference, you know? um well like how, like does, don't don't doesn't like technocracy require like certain like quote-unquote le like levels of people in society to fulfill the tasks so if, like yeah. everyone's a technocrat like what are those are those spots to be filled by like i don't well, know robots is that is that what <laughs> well i guess what i'm saying is i mean firstly i i mean that was just meant to be a bit of a thought experiment right like yeah, I, yeah. I don't i don't think that we could actually achieve that um but but ex except that when i read yeah, hi, Ron. Read read any dystopian fiction, right? Uh, or not any, but um, um, yeah. Who's the yeah, Julian? Like, in other words, what Max is saying is, who's the expert amongst only the experts? Technocracy is inherently hierarchical. Maybe. Um, think of something like Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, right? Um, and humans are. Are sort of like genetically. Uh, I, I think they're. It's been a long time since I read it, but but they're genetically engineered, or or it's or or eugenics. It's it's all eugenics, right? Uh, and yeah, they have all the sex drugs, right? Orgy porgy. Um, so uh, you know, in Brave New World, you have your alphas, betas, gammas, and deltas. So the alphas are like the philosopher kings, and the betas are you know, still pretty smart and good and nice looking, but they're not the best. And then the gammas and then the deltas at the bottom are dumb, uh, ugly, and they're doing the menial tasks. That's how I imagine an entirely technocratic society is like, yes, you have your experts on top, but you also have the expert who maybe just mops, sweeps and mops the floor. And that's all he's doing. That's all he's allowed to do. Maybe it's the only thing he's good at and maybe he's really good at it and he can't do anything else. Uh, but he's the floor sweeper guy. Uh, he's at the very bottom. Um, he's just a cog in the machine. Uh, that's how I imagine it. Um, but yeah. Um, anyway, let's, uh, let's move on. More Haberbass. Oh, we are doing okay for time, actually except for my computer being slow. All right. Yeah, if we, um, if we apply uh, instrumental reason to human communication, uh, we get colonization of the life world, right? Um, that's, that's how uh, Habermas understood the sort of thing that we were just talking about. Some feminist thinkers, though, like uh, Nancy Fraser is one that um, Duzek mentions here, uh, have argued that Habermas's concerns really amount to a defense of traditional patriarchy, right? Uh, Habermas denies this. Um, uh, he thinks that um, he thinks that feminism might be one of the strongest challenges to bureaucratic technology anyway. But um, and again, like this is something I'm I don't know if I ought to offer my two cents because I really don't know enough about either of these thinkers' work. Um, yeah. I guess because maybe there's a worry uh, among feminists like Frazier that, that what um, Habermas is defending is kind of like a, de a defense of a tr traditional way that humans, you know, a traditional way of being maybe 
Um, and maybe patriarchy is inherent within that. Um, I'm not sure. In any case, I'll continue. Duzik writes, one problem that both followers of Marxism and devotees of technology studies see in Habermas uh, is his sharp separation of instrumental reason and labor from communication and understanding. Traditional Marxists claim that Marx's concept of social labor is not devoid of human communication, though Marx's account of the role of communication within social labor is hardly fleshed out. Students of technology studies also wish to deny that technological reasoning can be totally separated as instrumental action from the communicative realm of politics and everyday life. Habermas's legitimate concerns about the application of pseudoscientific or crudely mechanistic scientific social theories to the management and control of social life, social engineering, are based on mistaken absolute dualism of labor and communication and of instrumental reason versus communicative understanding. So maybe there's a false dichotomy here, I guess, uh, is what some thinkers are saying um, uh, with respect to Habermas. Um, and maybe this problem arises from how he understands science. Um, Habermas characterizes science in positivist terms and, and in Popperian terms, right? So remember, positivism, we can say things about the world with language. Those things we say will be true or false. If we can't tell if it's true or false, well, it's meaningless. And we want true statements. We don't want false statements or meaningless statements, right? Popper's a bit different. Remember, he's the falsification guy. He's the guy who says that what science does is not really try to verify. It tries to falsify. Um, and Popper, while not a, not a member of the Vienna Circle, was associated with some of the thinkers in the Vienna Circle. Who were the positivists, the logical positivists? So Habermas pays a lot of attention to that, but he doesn't pay much attention to Kuhn or post kuhnian understandings. <sighs> of science and te technology. Remember, Thomas Kuhn is the, um, is the structure of scientific revolutions guy, right? He, he understands um, science as, uh, you know, from a sort of historical perspective where you'll have a paradigm that it eventually will, um, you know, as we learn more, as we do more science, figure more things out, uh, the paradigm can shift into something new. Kind of like how, you know, the physics of Aristotle gave way eventually to Newtonian physics and Newtonian physics, while still around, we know it's incomplete and we have new paradigms like relativity and quantum theory. Um, so, you know, Habermas doesn't really focus on that. He's more focused on the positivist stuff. So Dusik writes, it is interesting that Habermas uh, early denied that scientific facts and theories could find a place in the life world. He did this specifically in rejecting the writer Aldous Huxley's appeal for the incorporation of scientific facts and theories into literature. Um, so Habermas seems to be outright denying that scientific facts and theories have a place in our life world, but he's understanding science in this, you know, this kind of like almost, you know, hard line positivist kind of way. Um, and remember, the post kuhnian understanding of science and technology is where we start to encounter like uh, criticism of science, sociology of science, science studies, you know, studying science as a human activity, exposing its flaws, trying to make it better, you know. Um, um, and Aldous Huxley, the writer, uh, incorporates scientific facts and theories into, its, into his own literature. Uh, this is something that Habermas thought was silly because uh, that's still colonization of the life world, right? That's what he thinks. Um, let's talk about this for a minute. Can we, can we find a place in the life world for scientific facts? Can we and ought we? I guess is what I'm asking. I mean, I remember, I remember being young and if you'd have like, you know, a day where you stayed home from school, maybe you were maybe, maybe feeling sick or something. I remember daytime television, like morning shows, you know, 
sometimes I'd have that on the television and, you know, there'd be like a morning news show and um, somebody comes on there like, oh, coming up next, Dr. So-and-so who talks about uh, the new science behind the latest diet, right? You have things like this. Um, this is how you get your Dr. Oz's and your Dr. Phil's. Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, maybe those are not proper scientists. And maybe if we do the science right, if we get proper science, we can incorporate it into our life world, into human communication. I don't know. Can anyone think of any examples of how this could go right or how this could go wrong? I'd be curious to hear. I mean, think of all the apps you have on your phone. Nowadays, uh, nowadays people have apps for everything. Um, there's apps for uh, there's apps for like dieting. There's apps for exercise. There's apps for learning new skills. Oh, that's a pretty good point. Yeah, maybe we can flip it, like Vicente says. Uh, maybe the life world can influence science. Yeah, I think that's the, I think, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of strikes me as what science studies is supposed to be about, right? Or the sociology of scientific knowledge, um, using genuine human communication to, under, to, to sort of, you know, look at science. Philosophy of science is probably, is probably very much in this vein too. But yeah, I'm thinking of um, I'm thinking that, that that Habermas would probably look at some of the apps on 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 someone's cell phone and think, oh, this is terrible, right? Um, you know, there are there are apps which claims to use which claim to use the latest science um, that will uh, get you to exercise more, get you to lose weight, um, get you get you to be better at some skill, right? Um, this is this is colonization of the life world. Uh, that's that's probably one of the most salient examples that I can think of at any rate. Uh, to continue, I'm sorry that I'm yawning so much today, everyone. It's this it's this um, bloody occupation. Uh, to continue from page 62, Habermas's more moderate position largely replaces Marcus or uh, replaced Marcus's utopian but unarticulated call for a new emancipatory science and technology among practitioners of critical theory. This was in part because Habermas accepted science and technology as they are and incorporated a number of developments uh, in mid 20th century and social science, philosophy and social science. Okay, so I guess that just kind of contextual, contextualizes what we've been talking about. Question in the chat. Oh, Tess has an answer for uh, incorporating for colonization of the life world. I'm gonna go with yes, even the word rationality in modern day internet parlance pretty much refers to the subculture that just does try to live that way. Uh, for example, enjoys a good piece of hard sci-fi literature. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Um, also, yeah, how are you gonna have hard sci-fi uh, without talking about actual science? right? I like sci-fi. So you couldn't have a book series or a, a television show like The Expanse without incorporating actual science. And for those of you who have seen the show or read the books, you know what I mean. You could have a Star Wars. Absolutely. Because Star Wars is like not really sci-fi. It's not. It's samurai space wizards fighting space Nazis. Like it's it's a space opera. Yeah, Zach. Yes, exactly. Jinx. Yeah. It's a space opera. It's not sci-fi. Um, but you need, if you're gonna have a proper hard sci-fi, you need to have uh 
you need to have some actual science. So yeah, I, I, that's, that's a really good point, Tess. Thank you for, thank you for offering that. Um, and even in other areas, right. Um, you want to see, I kind of want to see things treat shows, treat things, book, treat things as accurately as possible. I don't know why, maybe, maybe it's because I'm, maybe it's because I'm just a rational guy. Right. But, um, one thing is, um, I'll give you an example. It's kind of a morbid example. Um, I was watching that show. Uh, this is a few years ago when the first season came out. I was watching Ricky Gervais Netflix show Afterlife, right? Spoiler alert. Um, there's, uh, there's a part in that first season where a guy overdoses, right? He does some heroin and he has an overdose and it's presented as this kind of like peaceful way to go. Um, you know, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to be alive anymore. He's a homeless man. He's a drug user. He doesn't want to be alive anymore. He gets a whole bunch of heroin, does it. And it's like, he just peacefully slips off to sleep. And that is just not the reality of a drug overdose. Um, and I know that because I, I've, I've helped stop them before. Um, I worked at uh, a coffee shop um, throughout grad school. I worked at this coffee shop near a homeless shelter. And, you know, downtown Ottawa, maybe you can guess which coffee shop and which shelter that was. But um, there was a person who appeared just to be passed out um, leaning up against uh, the sort of wooden, wooden fencing that was around our garbage dumpster. Uh, and I noticed uh, there was a woman talking to him, trying to make sure that he was okay. Um, and so I went outside to see what was going on. Um, and she told me she was calling an ambulance because he wasn't responding. And I said, uh, I guess he's having an overdose. And she said, yeah, I think that's what it's, what's happening. Um, so, so we had some uh, naloxone in our first aid kit. And I went and grabbed that. And uh, at the same time, some help had come. Some of the workers, uh, social workers and medics from the shelter had come on over. Um, so I opened up the, the naloxone. I gave it to the guy and um, he, you know, did the thing where you got to, you shoot it up somebody's nose. Um, and it's amazing that how this works. This guy, um, this guy came right back. Uh, but it's not a peaceful way to go. This guy was like blue. He was literally blue. Uh, it, it was, it was the, it was, um, it was like horrifying uh, to see somebody who they're gasping for breath once every 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, it was one of the strangest and, and most like hor horrific things I've ever seen, you know? And so when I saw this overdose scene in this show, I was just like, that's not how that works. And, you know, it, it, it pulled me out of the show, but it also kind of seemed a little disrespectful to you know, to suggest that this is just such a lovely, peaceful way to end your time on planet Earth. Very disrespectful to people who have been through an overdose. And, and you know, to those who have died this way. Um, yeah. So I guess I want to see things portrayed accurately, as accurately as possible. But then there's the argument to be made that maybe, no, I don't. I don't know. Maybe it depends what it is. Maybe it depends what it is. Maybe I want to go see, uh, you know, maybe I want to go see the latest Marvel movie and I want to forget about what is real, you know. Um, maybe I want to go and see Star Wars and not worry about the science. Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. Anyway, sorry guys, I was just blathering on there uh okay this is the last slide oh and there's a question in the chat
<laughs> USA industrial golf. Go ahead, Max. I was like, it started as a joke, but then I was like, actually, it's kind of serious though. Mm-hmm. Whereas like you're talking about like movies like portraying things in certain ways and that like actually affecting people like on two ways one like those people that have experienced it and are like okay that's not real and other people that perhaps like have not experienced it and also like just are relatively unaware of it just just but not there's no value judgment it's just like a a fact not everyone can understand everything just by a lack of time so like what they what they receive is what they get um unless they go or the way to find something else but marvel movies like specifically if you think about how the like these like ways that we perceive like reality and like technology or like observable experiences i'm trying to circle back to like what was talking about with um like forms that exist and then like our imperfections and being able to like show them so like using like movie as an example of that like you're trying to like convey a message or like have some element that's being displayed there but you're losing like a certain level of realism in that yeah and i think the where you bring in like the like the um dare i say sus element of it <laughs> is when it's for like a specific a specific agenda if it's to be like funny or if it's to be like you know making a uh, light of something that's serious or if it's like literally like in the marvel movies like the contracts like require to show the military in a certain way because they're using the equipment right um, so it's like it's just like i feel like with like media in any ways is like really important to understand like the technological and like legal and like just the developmental aspects of them to yeah to like yeah and that's just a, to look at like yeah because like that's with any art form though like that's yeah. why it's like a, a gap between like scientific objectivity realism and then translation yeah and also, I guess a big part of this is also ideology, which can sneak its way into art, right? Depending on who's making the art, right? Um, I, yeah, Tess, uh, both realism. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, don't lose track, which is which. But maybe whoever's making it could make it more difficult to lose track of or even what's what's real and what's fantasy, what's what's truth and what's propaganda, right? Um, okay, like so. Another example of this. One of my favorite. Uh, I really like this movie. Yeah, Vicente. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, watch any World War II movie made by Americans, and it's like the Americans did everything. No, they didn't. Come on, man. It was World War II, World War II, not USA versus Nazis um, and Japan. Like, come on. But yeah, like, think about, yeah, main character syndrome. That's a good way of putting it. Um, I mean, there are some good World War II movies, uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, but I like the ones that are historically accurate. Oh, Dunkirk was good. I liked Dunkirk. <laughs> <laughs> the allies was just one nation after all yeah <clears throat> i was thinking my 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 um my example was uh it's a movie called hero i like this movie because it's so cinematic it's just beautifully shot it's a martial arts movie it's a chinese martial arts movie right it's got jet Li and everybody donnie yen right a lot of big uh martial arts names um but you know a movie like that has to be approved um, and obviously it tells a very like uh, a very like you know uh, a story that the the Chinese Communist Party approves of um, which is a sort of uh, it's it's a story of a guy sacrificing himself so that uh, the emperor can go on and conquer everything and unify China and it'll be one um, one big uh, happy nation right uh and that's like oh yeah what a hero right but like come on like i like that movie i really do it really is a good movie but you know i it's always in the back of my mind like you know like they they let them make this they might not have let them make uh a different movie where the emperor if the emperor doesn't 
get to win and unify China, they're not making that movie. Right? But I like that. I still like it. It's still a good movie. But you have to keep in mind, like, oh, there's there's a little bit of there's a little bit of that in there. Uh, Greyhound. I, I want to see it. I have not seen Greyhound yet. I mean, but come on, Tom Hanks. I think most of Tom Hanks's movies would be good. Oh, yeah, the last. <laughs> I mean, they didn't even need Tom Cruise in that movie. Like. You know, I mean, yeah. That's that's the I mean, OK, there really was the the the, the, the the last samurai is based on the Satsuma rebellion. Which really happened. There really was uh, a group of like samurai uh, who opposed the Meiji restoration and and fought, um, you know, the Japanese army that did happen. Um, and there were, I think there were a couple of Westerners involved in that battle. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, um, the guy was French, uh, not American, uh, if I'm not mistaken. In any case, if I'm going to watch a samurai movie, I want to watch a samurai movie like, like made in Japan. I, I want the real thing. I don't want Tom Cruise samurai. I want like actual samurai movie. Yeah, that's what I want. It didn't need Tom Cruise. Could have just been about samurai. Just, just you know. Oh, some good samurai movies. Yeah, you got to watch some Akira Kurosawa, right? Seven, Seven Samurai. Watch Seven Samurai. You know, watch The Hidden Castle. Watch all those classics. Then go watch uh, Star Wars and see see the influence. Yeah, Yojimbo. I haven't seen Yojimbo, but I want to. I got to see Yojimbo. Uh, most things don't need Tom Cruise. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, that's funny. Um, yeah, I don't know. Tom Cruise is like, I mean, I guess I'll go see a movie with Tom Cruise, but but I'm always thinking like, oh yeah, but, it, but it's Tom Cruise. I, I always flash back to the couch jumping Oprah moment. I don't know. It's yeah. Max, go ahead. Um, yeah, great taste, by the way, with Hero 2002. <laughs> iconic classic but i think it's like really pointed to narrate not only is like the entire plot you know is what it is but like just every like major celebrity um just like has to do this like they like it's not even a method of like story writing or like of like um the plot it's like behind the scenes in the actual thing like any like actual famous actor has certain Listen, I'm gonna be careful what I say here so I can travel still, but like, there's certain obligations. Yeah. Um, I got that need you. to be met, like as a public figure, especially as one that has a like wealth. Um, yeah. Because of control capitalism, which yeah. is, I don't know, really efficient. So like, shout out to them. Like it's... Jack Ma. Jack Ma probably needs to blink twice so we know that he's okay. But yeah. <laughs> no, it's true. Like it's, it's working. And China's economy is is growing like crazy. Um, so that is working. But yeah, it's true. Another example, just, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get banned in China or anything, but um, the Eat Man movies, those are fun too. Like Hong Kong martial arts uh, kind of thing. You know, Donnie Yen. Uh, but there's a lot, uh, it, it, it's all that, like it, it's it's uh what's the style it's wing chun kung fu and so they'll they'll do things like where donnie yen is fighting um oh that's funny <laughs> yeah yeah the second one is is where he fights the boxer right yeah so he's fighting this british boxer and i totally i i mean i i'm just gonna say i really i i was into how they were portraying the british absolutely i was here for that yeah, I was I was here for that. My background is British. I know that yeah, colonialism sucks and and I'm like no, let's let no, we were the baddies. We were the baddies. I'm not we're the baddies. So I it was great. The 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 British were presented as these, you know, colonial doofuses and um yeah, like okay, so you you it's even better, Max, for you. You get like both sides of it. I only get the one side, but I was just like, yeah, that, 
I mean, fair enough. Um, and then he fights this boxer. And, the you know, this boxer's like this huge boxer, all muscled up. And Eat Man is just like, you know, ha, huh, like with his with his effortless Wing Chun moves and he's beating this boxer and it's like, oh, come on. Like, this is not believable at all. But I, I mean, I still like the movie. But you have to keep in mind what you're watching, right? So I guess, um, I guess it's good. You know, it's fine. It's like, you need to know. Yeah, in the third one, he fights Mike Tyson. What is Mike Tyson's like? Hey, I, if you can last for three minutes, and he sets his watch for three minutes, and he fights Mike Tyson and doesn't die. So, <laughs> like, come on. I'll have to click on this after. I don't. I'll. I'll. I'll watch this link after. But okay, let's finish up. Uh, we're not going to end up with a discussion of risk benefit analysis. Um, Oh, okay, good. Yeah, check it out. Check it out. I mean, the Eat Mon movie, I mean, they're, they're fun. They're fun. But it's all, it, but the message is very much Chinese martial arts are the best. You know, that's very much the message. The first movie was really cool, though, because that's where Eat Man fights the Japanese, right? And they really were like, you know, um, not cool in their imperial ambitions, right? So um, I haven't seen Drunken Mast. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, they were not cool. Not cool is an understatement. The the uh, Japan's um, Japan's imperial uh, efforts. I mean, well, the 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 Nanking massacre. Uh, you can go into the history of it. Uh, obviously, I don't have time to talk about it. Oh as yeah 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 as bad as bad yeah and dominic the great leap forward too well and that was after uh that was uh, that was after um all of the all of the horrific atrocities that were brought to like you know like like chinese manchuria korea um all of that uh and then you had the the nationalists and the communists in China fighting, you know, Mao and the communists and Chiang Kai-shek and the, and the nationalists. And, and then Mao wins. Chiang Kai-shek goes to Taiwan. Um, yeah, maybe less, maybe less technocratic. Yeah, the Japanese, I would say, are less technocratic. But yeah, um, absolutely brutal um, colonial uh, conquering. So, yeah. Uh, so when I watch the first Eat Man movie and Eat Man beats the Japanese commander, I'm kind of like, yeah, you you go get him, Eat Man, you know? Yeah, Taiwan. Good old Taiwan. I had a colleague who, I think, emigrated from Taiwan back in grad school. Um, so that's, yeah, I'm going to, I think I'll wrap it up. Uh, I was, I was hoping to end up with some freeform discussion on risk benefit analysis, but instead we had some freeform discussion about um, uh, scientism and technocracy intruding in the life world uh, as evidenced by motion pictures, um, which I mean, come on, this is what I'm here for. Uh, <laughs> this is why I love what I do. So even though we didn't get quite to what I wanted to get to, we still had an interesting discussion that covered a lot of interesting things. So yay, good for us. Thanks everybody for that discussion. That was nice. It's 1251. That next class. All right, well, maybe um, maybe uh, we'll come back from reading week and, and finish it up, you know, because because uh, no, yeah, we'll, we'll keep it short. Max, we'll keep it short. But there is something to say about utilitarianism and risk-benefit analysis, which uh, the one thing I'll say is that where utilitarianism, like I say here, sums pleasures and pains, quoting from Duzek, um, uh, risk-benefit analysis sums benefits and risks. And usually these are given in terms of money. So we run into all kinds of problematic ethical situations where we are trying to assign a dollar value to everything from, from material objects, from artifacts, to people, to nature itself. 
right? Um, and that, I mean, you can imagine the ways in which that might be a little problematic, I'm sure. Okay, let's get uh, going here. Let's stop the screen share. Is this a bearded dragon? Is that what kind of lizard that is? Yeah, yeah, I have a bearded dragon as a pet. That's oh, that's name. that's cool. That's cool. What's yeah. his name, if you don't mind me asking? Kaiser. Kaiser. <laughs> the nice. emperor. Nice. I should have called him the princess, though. The princess. <laughs> so lazy. <laughs> that's great. I'll... I've never had a reptile as a pet, uh, but I understand that they're quite cool. They are. Um, that's why they need so much expensive heating lamps. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, but... I'll sh I can bring him out next time, the next after reading week. Oh, as long as it doesn't stress him out or anything being on camera. Um, no, I don't. Yeah, <laughs> he's not smart enough for that. Okay, so. <laughs> perfect. All right. Well, look, everybody, this was a good discussion today. I see some of you have already taken off, anxious to start reading week. That's fine. For the rest of you, um, oh yeah, go ahead with your question, uh, Stefan. Or you can ask me after it, either, either way. Oh, how's the marking going? Um, not as fast as I wanted. But as I said, I have offered an extension. And um, if I prove, if I, if I end up following further behind, I will give you more time. Uh, I want you to have at least a couple of days to digest uh, the feedback so that you can, you know, apply it to your thing. So... I know that things haven't been clicking along as smoothly as I would like. And I admit that a lot of that has to do with, um, some of that has to do with the occupation and some of it has to do with um, some things that are going around, uh, going on around my building. I've got my landlord trying to sell the building uh, that I live in and that's just annoying. Um, so uh, I'm going as fast as I can. Liam has already done a whole bunch of his grading, um, but I'm going to, get my share done as soon as I can. And if necessary, I can always give you extra time. So, so no worries. Other than that, um, thanks everybody. I hope you have a really good reading week. I hope you stay safe and healthy and I hope you get a chance to relax. I hope it's not all studying and reading and writing papers. And I'll see you all the week after next. We'll come back, quick discussion of, um, cost benefit analysis or risk benefit analysis and then we'll move on to the next chapter okay have a good reading week everyone bye for now